So uh, we're very happy now to continue uh, with the next session um, with a slight change of direction. Um, now we're going to be focusing more on numerical uh, approaches to gravitation and string theory. Um, and with that, Paul Figueres, who's at uh, Queen Mary in London, although not perhaps physically at Queen Mary in London, uh, is going to tell us about the uh, status of weak cosmic censorship. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's a great pleasure. And I suppose that uh, for many other participants, it would be an even uh, greater pleasure uh, if I could meet you all live in uh, Bangalore. So I'm quite hopeful that this can happen uh, sooner than later. But for the time being, uh, I guess that we have to do things remotely. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about the weak cosmic censorship conjecture, what is the current status of this conjecture, and I would like to emphasize some of the aspects of this conjecture related to quantum gravity. Uh, as in all these virtual talks, uh, it's a bit you know weird to, it feels very impersonal, so please, if you have questions during my talk, feel free to interrupt me at any time and, and, and ask those questions. I prefer that we uh, run out of time and have a lot of discussion rather than just wait until the end because it feels like I'm talking to my uh, laptop, which is not like you know, particularly great. Well, anyway, so um, it's not going. Okay, good. So Singularities and black hole formations are uh, of great importance and was reflected in last year's Nobel Prize in Physics, which was awarded to Roger Penrose for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of the theory of general relativity. But in fact, uh, Penrose, his more main result are the so-called singularity theorems. And singularity theorems, as I will try to argue, uh, they have nothing to do in principle with uh, with black holes. And the relation between those singularity theorems and black holes is at the heart of this weak cosmic censorship conjecture, which I'm going to be talking about. So as I said, singularity theorems, which is the main result that Penrose proved and that's why he was awarded the Nobel Prize, only tell us that Singularities, which are places where the theory of general relativity breaks down, form generically. And this is something which should not be too surprising since GR is a nonlinear theory. And there are many other nonlinear theories where uh, likewise singularities form. And hydrodynamics is just another example of a nonlinear theory where uh, singularities form. So some of the questions which are not addressed by Penrose's uh, the singularity theorems are firstly, what type of singularities form uh, generically in general relativity? Um, these type of theorems tell us nothing about it. And of course, this is important because depending on what type of singularities form, we may or may not be relevant for the real world or even for um, quantum gravity. And also, Another question is whether singularities are all hidden inside black holes somehow. And this latter question, as I said, is related to weak cosmic censorship. So why we care about singularities? Singularities, we typically associate them to the strong field regime of the theory, in this case, GR. And we know, at least for all known examples, black holes do contain singularities in their interior. And as I said earlier, singularities basically signal where GR breaks down and in principle, it should be replaced by a theory of quantum gravity. So another related important question is whether they are observable because if they are, they could give us some hints of what this sort theory of quantum gravity is. So another related question Oh, topic is, is the fact that GR has a well posed initial value problem. And this is non trivial. It took uh, almost 40 years for these mathematicians to prove this statement. And what this statement says is that uh, for generic uh, initial data, solutions to the Einstein equations exist and they are unique and they are continuously related, uh, connected to these uh, initial data. So this statement uh, in principle says that GR is a classically predictive theory of 
gravity. And this is a conceptual requirement that we would like to impose in any classical theory. But now here's the, the issue that uh, Penrose uh, understood, which is the fact that on the one hand, singularity theorems tells us that singularities form generically and singularities, at least uh, for now, are just places, uh, regions where the theory breaks down. So if the singularities form generically, thus this theory, GR, have any real predictive power. Because after all, all these well poisonous uh, results only tell you that solutions in principle only exist for an arbitrarily uh, short time, right? It doesn't tell you anything about the global existence of solutions. And this is a much harder mathematical question. So if singularity is formed generically, then it's not at all clear that the theory has any predictive power at all. So to address this issue of the real predictive power of GR in the face that singularities occur generically, Penrose formulated the so-called weak cosmic censorship conjecture, which uh, um, mathematical terms state that generic asymptotically flat initial data have maximal development possessing a complete fusional infinity. So for physicists, what this conjecture, what this statement means is that in principle, observables, if this conjecture is true, so observ observers that remain in regions of low curvature should be able to just sit there for arbitrary long times, conduct classical experiments and use classical physics to predict the outcome of such experiments. And in other words, no, no unknown uh, Planck scale physics should hit you whilst you just sit in these regions of low curvature, right? So according to these, uh, if this conjecture is true that indeed, uh, in generic situations, uh, GR should have some predictive power. Hi, a uh, question. Yeah. yeah, when you talked about the initial data, given the initial data, uh, you know, you can basically, uh, you know, describe GR perfectly. Uh, I didn't understand the actual meaning there because, you know, uh, general relativity in, in essence is like a, a partial differential equation of sorts, right? And anytime you're given initial data and boundary conditions, you could basically solve the equation. So what is so special about the statement made before? Uh, well, uh, yeah. Well, the fact that you can actually solve these equations is 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 is, is non-trivial in GR. First, for two reasons. So, first, because if you write down the Einstein equations, it's not all obvious that you can solve them because the equations do not have uh, like an obvious wave-like character. So, for that, you need to choose some gauge. So, first of all, you need to be one aspect of this theorem that one has to prove first is that this gauge condition is consistent, and you can just impose it throughout the evolution. And this is where the nonlinearity of the theory comes in. The second aspect is, what do you mean by generic initial data? And this is, a, this is something which has only been proven in recent years. You mean, since the Einstein equations are second order equations, you, add, you don't want initial data, you don't want to fix too high derivatives in the initial data, because in a way the equations only tell you about to up to the second derivatives, right? So the fact that you can control initial data with only up to two derivatives is in fact a non-trivial thing that you can do in, in Einstein's theory. So, so that basically the, this, uh, uh, yeah. So it is non-trivial that the solutions exist in GR for like generic solutions exist. Okay. All right. So thanks for the question. So just coming back to, to this uh, conjecture, um, the point is that whether this is true or not. After all, this is a conjecture. So just let me summarize what is known in astrophysical settings. And in astrophysical settings, um, there are no known counterexamples. If you assume spherical symmetry, then in order to have non-trivial dynamics, you need to introduce matter. And in the model, Einstein scalar field model in spherical symmetry, Christodoulou in the early 90s proved this conjecture, which means that for generic initial data, he showed that either you form a black hole and therefore which will have a singularity or you don't have any singularity. And the class of initial data for which you can form a naked singularity is at least co-dimension one in the space of initial conditions, which in this context has a very, uh, can be decide, the, the defined precisely. 
So by looking at this special initial data that sits in this co-dimension one surface, Choptic, in the early days of numerical relativity, managed to construct numerically a zero mass naked singularity. And furthermore, the singularity, the point is that this singularity is unstable and non-generic. And this led to the discovery of, of gravitational critical phenomena and so on and so forth. In recent years, there's been progress in the mathematical community in, uh, by this author, Christo Luru again, and some others, which basically showed that for generic initial data, for an open set of, of initial data, one can form a trap surface in full generality without symmetry assumptions. But again, this does not prove the conjecture, um, but it's, if you want, one step in the right direction. So that's basically all that's known in in the astrophysical setting. And what we will see in the rest of this talk is that this conjecture is likely to be false in high dimensions, both as in asymptotically flat boundary conditions or kaluza klein spaces. In recent years, there have been some potential counterexamples in asymptotically anti decita spaces, uh, which I also discuss. But the bottom line is that in the four dimensional asymptotically flat case, this conjecture remains still unproven and there are no known counterexamples. And in fact, one would be, uh, it seems that there's a chance that this conjecture is true in four dimensions, but not in these other cases, as I will discuss. So um, before I jump into the weak cosmic censorship conjecture, I just want to uh, make sure that you don't get confused with the so-called strong cosmic censorship conjecture, which you may have heard about, uh, because there's been some development in the literature uh, in, the, in the last few years. So this conjecture, again, is also related to the classical predictivity of general relativity. And this conjecture states that there is no suitably differential continuation across the Cauchy horizon. So Cauchy horizon basically is the boundary of the region that you can predict given some initial data. So this conjecture tells that this boundary is singular. Some some kind of singular, uh, singularity, and we don't know what type of singularity. And as I said, in recent years, there's been progress uh, in understanding this conjecture, especially in the sitter. But I have nothing to say about this <coughs> in, in this talk. And I just want to emphasize that the weak cosmic censorship conjecture and the strong cosmic censorship conjecture are unrelated and they are independent of each other, even though the names are confusingly similar. Um, so in the rest of this talk, I will only be concerned with a weak cosmic censorship conjecture. But I just want to stress that uh, proving or disproving one tells you nothing about the other. Okay, so the outline of the rest of, uh, of my talk is as follows. So first I will discuss these known uh, potential counterexamples in high dimensions and in kaluza klein spaces. And I'll try to emphasize why this is something that might be related to quantum gravity somehow. And then I'll discuss also anti theta space. And as we shall see, the nature of the counterexamples in anti theta is fundamentally different uh, from the counterexamples that we encounter in high dimensions. And I will finally summarize and conclude. And I just want to re-emphasize that please, uh, you should interrupt me if I say something too outrageous or, or something just manifestly wrong or whatever. And uh, I prefer to have some discussion during the talk. I feel less lonely. Uh, okay, so let me start with the uh, high dimensions. So the best and uh, most studied example is the Gregory Laflamme instability of black strings. So let me first remind you of what black strings are. So black strings are one of the simplest examples of high dimensional black holes, which are solutions to the Einstein vacuum equation. So you just consider the Schwarzschild uh, metric as you see here. And then if you add a flat direction, which you then compactify on a circle of length L, this line element solves the Einstein vacuum equations in five dimensions in this case, but the resulting spacetime is not asymptotically flat. It's asymptotically four-dimensional Minkowski space times a circle that has length L. This is a black hole, has a horizon located at R equals 2M, the usual location for Schwarzschild. And 
this horizon is uniformly extended along this circle. So the topology of the horizon is the two sphere inherited from Schwarzschild times the uh, compact circle of the geometry. So this seemingly um, boring geometry turns out to have very interesting dynamics as first shown by uh, Gregory Laflamme in the early 1990s, who showed that when the two, the ratio, this dimensionless ratio between the two dimensional length scales that characterize this geometry is less than some order one number, the details are not important, then this geometry is unstable. And by this, what I mean is that there exist uh, exponentially growing linear perturbations on top of this geometry. So these perturbations, oops, sorry, these uh, perturbations um, break the symmetry along this circle, introducing ripples like so. And it was conjectured by Gregor Laflamme that uh, the endpoint of this instability would be a localized uh, black hole on this circle. And because this was the entropically favored solution that they envisaged that should exist. So the term, however, this poses a problem from the point of view of GR, which is in order for this geometry to localize into a black hole, the horizon has to pinch. And by just some classical theorems, uh, this cannot happen in a smooth way. So if this horizon has to pinch, then a singularity should become visible before uh, the pinch off. So in principle, the evolution of this instability could lead uh, to a naked singularity, which should be visible. Now, determining the endpoint of this instability uh, was, uh, it took a long, a long time. And in this, in, this, uh, in this endeavor, I mean, Toby played a, a very important role because he was the first one to discover that there existed uh, static, non-uniform black strings uh, with the same boundary conditions but he showed that, at least in five dimensions, those black strings were not entropically favored. So they could not be the endpoint of such an instability. So uh, whether singularity form or not remained open uh, for, for a long time until uh, these two gentlemen uh, did a full numerical GR uh, simulation. And they showed that this uh, uniform black string evolve into a black string with a horizon that has some kind of fractal structure consisting of a sequence of blobs connected by, uh, st by strings, pieces of string. So these blobs and strings in this dynamical geometry are in fact quasi-stationary. So they are very well approximated by the static solutions. So they evolve on a very, on a very long time scale. And indeed you can uh, quantitatively understand this geometry as the sequence of big blobs connected by long and thin st strings. And this structure repeats itself on different scales. What, what is the instability happening because of, is it because of radiation? Um, just, a, just a general perturbation. You can consider just general perturbations, uh, gravitational perturbations in this case. So you could think of it as, as radiation. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe one maybe one could say that the black hole almost it's like it's got a surface tension mm -hmm. and wants to form drops yeah in fact oh. I'll, I'll come to this point in a sec um so moreover Luis Lennon and Franz Pretorius they conjectured well they sorry they conjectured they claim that the dynamics these dynamics that leads to the formation of this fractal uh, horizon is self-similar in the sense that, as I said earlier, you can understand this geometry as just a sequence of black strings, which are quasi-stationary, connected, connecting big bulges. So if you know a generation, say a bulge and a string, then you know this, is, this string is unstable because the strings that form here are highly unstable. And then if you know the radius of this string, then you can predict what is the, gonna be the radius of the next generation. And they found, or they claim, that you could relate the size of, say, black string and blob from one generation to the next by just an overall rescaling. The uh, point. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you like that. Yes. Uh, to what the color, uh, the color analysis stand for? 
uh, in this this color, if I remember correctly, is this stands for the from curvature invariant. So the fact that this is <coughs> that this is pink here means that this part of the geometry is approximates very well a static five dimensional asymptotically flat Schwarzschild solution with the normalization that they chose. And I think these portions of strings, which are yellow-ish, again, it shows that the corresponding curvature invariant approximates very well the suitably normalized in curvature invariant of a black string, of a static black string. So this is a quantitative way to show what I said earlier, that these geometries can be really very well approximated by a sequence of static solutions. Yeah, thank you. So, they, as I said, they claim that the dynamics is self-similar, which implies that the development of these structures follows a geometric series. So this leads to the conclusion that this string will reach zero size and therefore it will pinch off in a finite time. And since there is the perturbations that one has to consider to trigger this instability are completely generic, there's no fine tuning, then this is an example in which you would form a naked singularity in finite time and is generic. So just to show how this dynamics is qualitatively and perhaps quantitatively similar to what happens in fluids, this is just a result of an experiment of an instability of, the, uh, of a column of fluid. And as you can see, um, you can see the same structures as we saw with the black holes. In particular, you see the formation of droplets connected by long and thin necks and structures repeat themselves at, uh, on different scales. But in the case of fluids, we know a bit more. In the case of fluids, um, because we can do experiments, then what we know is that in, for this type of instabilities in fluid, hydrodynamics eventually breaks down and it breaks down where it should, which is when this, uh, this uh, neck uh, is, is about to pinch. Right, because the gradients are very large, and that's uh, precisely the regime which hydrodynamics cannot describe. So indeed, in this case, there is a loss of classical predictivity because the classical theory breaks down. And it's molecular dynamics that takes care of the pinch off of the column of fluid. But now the point is that in this hydrodynamic example, it's a, the portion of the fluid that is governed by uh, molecular dynamics is microscopic. So only a microscopic amount of fluid is uh, taken care of by this unknown molecular dynamics. Furthermore, the approach to the pinch off and the departure from the pinch off of this fluid is controlled by an attractor, which means that the details of how you get to the pinch off or the details of how this pinch off takes care are completely raised. Uh, by the time you reach the classical regime again, which is described by hydrodynamics. So in this fluid example, whilst it is true that there is a loss of classical predictivity because the theory of hydrodynamics breaks down, this loss is minimal because it only involves a microscopic amount of say mass. So one of the open questions in the field is whether the same happens in the case of the gray of flame instability. So what are the issues in this topic? So first is that these simulations that uh, Luis and Franz did are the only simulations that exist. Um, and these are quite complex. And in any sort of complex problem of this type, we would like to have uh, some independent check. It's not that I'm saying that what they, they do is wrong, but uh, it's important to have some independent check. Also because um, in the simulations, uh, in the initial data, it has zero total momentum and they excite the most unstable mode. So this mode uh, has a Z2 symmetry. So the simulation should in principle have this symmetry about the big blob. And if you look at the movies that they have in the website, this symmetry is lost uh, due to numerical errors at the latest stages of the simulation. And in fact, uh, in this type of simulations, numerical noise uh, can trigger some instability. So one has to be very careful in terms of understanding what is triggered by numerical noise and what is the real physics of this instability. And it seems to me 
that the evolution cannot possibly be self-similar beyond the third generation. And the reason, again, is related to what Toby said, that these black holes have some surface tension. So up until the third generation, everything proceeds pretty much by symmetry. But if you think about it, once you form the third generation of blobs, this blob, the third generation, will be surrounded by two pieces of string of different thickness. Because this string has a tension, the portion of the string with greater thickness has greater tension, so it will pull the blob, the blob in a certain direction. So this generates a motion of the satellites that happens on a time scale, which is of the same order as the time scale of the development of the, of the next generation. So it will break this self-similarity and it will lead to a further thinning of the string, which is independent of the, of the development of the gregula flamme instability. And we've seen explicit examples of this happening in another system that I will discuss uh, in a minute. So what we are doing now with um, some collaborators are just... Uh, so let me ask, so you are saying that the self, so they observe the self-similarity because the precision was not good enough to see the small breaking of self-similarity? I think by symmetry, the evolution is pretty much self-similar up until the third generation. But then uh, once this is uh, third generation forms, then there are these local dynamics, which, uh, so, are, which are related okay. to tension dynamics, which break this self-similarity. So, so later and the Praetorius, they observed self-similarity even higher generation? They, they say that they observed up until four generations, but that's uh -huh. only for their lowest, uh, lowest resolution simulations. Okay, and, if you okay. see, and if you see the, the plot that I, I, I showed earlier, if you look at about the big blob, on one side, you've got more generations than on the other side, which to me okay. suggests that mm -hmm. this was triggered by numerical noise mm -hmm. rather than, than, than the instability itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we are now using a completely independent method and evolution. We are now trying to reproduce uh, or looking into this and we have some partial results. Um, so that's just an, uh, an evolution of an unstable string using it's a slightly different initial data than what they use, so different mass, that's why the shapes look slightly different. And we can see up until the second generation, and this simulation is running as I'm speaking. Uh, so I cannot tell you what's going on, what's gonna happen, but uh, just to say there is work in progress, so hopefully we can uh, clarify of the, some of these issues that I just raised. So again, uh, just want to stress, it seems that the self-similarity they describe is unlikely. Uh, and Paul, uh, one small question. Uh, yes. And just curious, uh, the time scale of uh, the simulations, um, are they you know, So these simulations is, is a two plus one simulation, um, but it's a time scale is months. So now ours has been running for uh, about a month now. Uh, on, yeah, using, I mean, it's not like, uh, your lattice simulations, so it's 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 it's, it's less costly. Costly, uh, we run on a few like a few thousand cores. I think now it's probably four thousand uh, at the stage we are in now, and it's taking a month now. So yeah, it's been running for a month. So it's cheaper than the ones that you guys do. These are more serious stuff. Okay, but this is two plus one. So, as I said, the self similarity as described as in my opinion, is unlikely to uh, to hold beyond the third generation. And we will see an explicit example of this. And also the main point that we would like to address is to find evidence for uh, an attractor uh, that controls the pinch off, similar to what happens in fluids. And I think that's something which uh, we might be able to, to tell. So these are the main issues in my opinion. So um, now I move on to another set of examples. Because in this case, that of the black string, the black string is wrapping a topological circle. So it becomes unstable, then of course it has to pinch off. There's no, it, it cannot unwrap, uh, it cannot contract that circle. That circle is a topological circle in space. So the only thing that the string can do is break. So you might say, well, I mean, that seems a bit uh, um, contrived or forced upon the system. So can we find other examples where, they are, where the topology of the space-time does not play any role. For example, in flat space, where the topology of the space is trivial. So uh, 
I'll come to that now. And when you're given a, such a, answer, uh, a question in a talk, there are basically five possible answers. Yes, no, zero, one, or infinity, okay? So here the answer turns out to be yes, as you might have uh, guessed correctly. So before I move on to these examples, let me just remind you of some relevant facts about the physics of black holes in asymptotically high dimensional, asymptotically flat high dimensional spaces. So firstly, is that in dimensions greater than four, black holes can have a non-spherical topology. And the first example is the so-called black ring whose horizon topology is uh, S1 cross S2 in five dimensions. Um, but I just want to stress that in this case, the topology of the space-time is trivial. So in principle, the S1 in the black ring is a contractible uh, cycle. Um, but there are now other uh, non-trivial topologies that are known. Another relevant aspect of uh, high dimensional black hole physics is that again, in dimensions greater than four, black holes can have an arbitrarily large angular momentum. And it is precisely in this regime in which the angular momentum is very large that this these black holes become highly distorted. And as it happens in many physical systems, when the system is highly deformed, then the system is likely to become unstable and black holes are no different in this respect. And by now there are a bunch of known instabilities that afflict high dimensional black holes precisely in this regime where they spin very fast. So the first example that I want to discuss is that of black rings because black rings, when you look at them from very short distance, they look like black strings. And when they, are, uh, then they spin very fast, their angular momentum is very large, then they have a very large radius. So indeed they quantitatively look like, uh, you can approximate them very well by black strings. And unsurprisingly, it had been shown that indeed these rapidly spinning very large black rings have a Gregor Flam type of instability. So uh, the natural question to ask is what is the endpoint of this instability? So we investigated this question with some PhD students a few years ago. And what we did is we just take one of these black rings, which are known analytically in five dimensions. We considered them in this regime where they spin very fast and we perturb them. And then we solve the Einstein equations numerically in a, in a computer. So I just want to emphasize that for this black ring problem, then this is really a three plus one evolution as opposed to the black string problem, which is two plus one. So in this case, it's more costly and therefore we cannot learn as much detail as uh, for the black strings in terms of the uh, formation of the singularity. So we could not address the questions that I raised uh, for the black string. So I'm just gonna show you the result of a simulation of one of these perturbed black rings. And here what we see is the shape of, of the horizon. Okay, so as you can see, this black ring evolves into this shape, uh, just, just another view of the same, of the same snapshot, oh, actually uh, slightly later. And again, as for the black strings, you can really quantitatively understand these uh, dynamical geometries as a sequence of black strings. So these portions can be very well approximated by black strings, similar to the ones that I described earlier, connecting uh, big static black holes. So here you see that there are four of them because for this type of black ring, it turns out that the most unstable mode is one which has M equals four, or if you do a Fourier decomposition of the perturbations on a circle. So that's the fastest growing mode. And it leads to these structures. Now, this case- Paul, uh, uh, no, we, Paul, I'm curious, yes. uh, you know, in the GL, in, uh, the examples that you're showing, uh, is there a, you know, how, how is that uh, correlated to the V uh, uh, censorship conjecture? Is the singularity behind, uh, uh, the horizon uh, in the after the instabilities come about? Uh, well, I mean, so the point is that it, even with the black strings, and I was now about to argue with black rings, um, in a finite amount of time, the singularity, the, the horizon pinches off. So it reaches zero size and therefore arbitrarily large curvatures should become observable in a finite amount of time. So it is in this respect that a singularity should become visible. 
Okay. And, okay. And, and therefore naked. But I will okay. come back to this point later um, because there are some issues related to this statement that I just made. Uh, but yes, so the point is that in principle, when the horizon pinches off, it's when the singularity inside the black hole becomes visible. Okay. So just coming back to these black rings, uh, you can see that this shape indeed has a quadrupole moment. So this object is rotating and is radiating energy, it's radiating mass and angular momentum. So is shrinking. So this, the S1 of the ring is shrinking. However, the radiation uh, emission follows a power law. But once you reach this stage, as I said, these are basically black strings. So they are highly unstable because you can see that they are very long and very thin. So they're highly unstable. The development of the Gregula flam instability or in any of these string-like portions is exponential in time. So by the time you reach this regime, these black strings, which will, which are unstable, will pinch off before the black ring has had time to radiate away all the angular momentum and shrink. So this shows that even in asymptotically flat spaces, you will necessarily form naked singularities of the same type that we have seen with black strings in a finite amount of time, and in principle, um, well, observable by asymptotic observers. But as I said, this is a much more expensive simulation, so we could not uh, look into the details of how this singularity is formed. So for that, uh, we, what we did is we looked at another example, which are rotating spherical black holes. So these black holes uh, that we're going to consider are literally the analogs of the curse solution in dimensions higher than four, literally. So the, you see the line element is very similar to the curse solution. And it turns out that these black holes in dimensions six and above, they can rotate arbitrarily fast without uh, hitting an extremal bound as the curse solution does. And again, it is in this regime of rapidly spinning uh, black holes that one encounters dynamical instabilities. And it had been shown a few years ago that they are some of these instabilities are of the Gregula flam type. So this opens the possibility that these unstable black holes could uh, indeed evolve into naked singularities in a manner similar to black strings. So again, that's uh, what we did with my students and with Leonard. So we took one of these rapidly spinning black holes. Just want to emphasize that the regime in which you see these instabilities is not that you have to go to values of say dimensionless spin <coughs> of like a hundred or a thousand. So it's just all the one values, right? So these black holes are deformed. They look like pancakes, but I mean, they are not like uh, crazily rapidly spinning, right? So it's just some order one value of the spin. So the idea is just the same as before. We take one of these black holes, we perturb it, and we, we solve the Einstein equations. In this case, um, for this particular example, we selected a particular class of perturbations, namely those perturbations that do not break the rotational symmetry of the background. So these perturbations preserve the evolution restricted to this class of perturbations conserves angular momentum. Okay, there's no angular momentum radiation. You might think that this is rather natural and might lead to non-generic violations, but I would argue that if you just added these perturbations with a sufficiently large amplitude, then those would lead to the dominant dynamics. Even if they have, they're not the fastest growing ones, uh, you can always arrange initial data for which these ones would dominate. And that's in fact uh, what we have seen. So we just restrict to this particular class because if we solve the Einstein equations within this class, then it turns out to be a two plus one problem, hence cheaper, so we can get closer to the singularity. So that's what we are gonna see here. It's just, uh, just the same, so that's just a, a cut of the black hole through the middle, and that's just seen from above. And just the idea is the same as before. We solve the Einstein equations numerically, and that's what happens. So again, we add the perturbation, again, with small amplitude. So for a long time, nothing happened. But uh, at late times, you can see that now this uh, is going to want to pinch off through uh, the rotation axis, which goes to the middle. And now notice that time will start to slow down. Okay, so this instability, again, this black hole wants to evolve 
into a black ring, but the hole in the middle is filled by some very thin membrane, which itself is Gregory Ola Flam unstable, and it evolves into a sequence of rings connected by uh, portions of membranes which are very unstable. So if we look closely at the, at the last snapshot, just a transverse view, and we zoom in, we can see the same structures repeating themselves on, on different scales. Again, rings uh, filled in by portions of very thin membranes, which are uh, Gregor Flamand stable. Now, the point I want to make here is if you look at this snapshot, you can see one of these rings, which is surrounded by two pieces of membrane. On one side is thicker than on the other side. And the same is obvious for this other uh, ring we see here. So what happens when you actually look at this closely is that these rings here would be pulled towards the left because this piece of membrane has a uh, higher tension than this piece here because it's thicker. So what happens then is that this portion here would get thinner because not just because the regular farm instability, but just because of this motion of these rings of these blocks. And this motion happens on a time scale, which is comparable to the time scale that it takes for the next generation to, uh, to form. So in this particular example, we didn't see these uh, self-similar dynamics that Luis and Franz reported for the black strings precisely because of this motion of induced by tension dynamics of each of these blobs. Now this has a one important consequence, which is because these portions of membrane become thinner, the process of reaching the singularity is faster than if you just had these like scale invariant uh, type of dynamics. Um, so indeed, in this case, we also found evidence that uh, these membranes would pinch off and hence uh, naked singularity would be visible in finite time. Sorry, Pal, can I just uh, clarify? Are, are you saying that there may be no further generations on this thin piece of string here? No, that, that, that will, that... Yeah, there will be further generations, but this piece of string yeah. will be thinner than what it would have been if you hadn't taken into account the motion of these blobs. So in fact, I... it will evolve faster because it will be thinner. So you could have a new critical scaling. You could have a new critical scaling. So in my opinion, uh, what is going to be like where you may find this attractor is precisely in these regions. So this is where it's gonna, so in a droplet of fluid, this is where it pinches. And I, we haven't analyzed this in detail, but I bet I'm willing, I'm hopeful that one can find some kind of, so basically the geometry near this portion of the big blob should be the same as the geometry here. So it is in this sense that you will see some form of, a, of an attractor that the geometry controlling the pinch of will be independent of where it is on the, on the black string and how it got there. But I don't think that you could be able to find some kind of scaling that will tell you anything about the formation of a generation on this portion if you know this and uh, uh, the previous information of the previous generation. I think that's that's what that's what should happen, but I have no uh, evidence yet. Thank you. So, um, in all these previous examples, um, you might say, well, um, of course, there's no fine tuning in the initial data and so on, but the initial black hole is unstable. So, are these examples generic or not? And again, as in all talks, I say we have five possible answers. I could uh, poll here what would be the answers, but because we have to do this virtually, you would be forced to post your answers by post. And as we know, posting uh, votes can lead, would might likely lead perhaps to the second worst fraud uh, in, in history, according to some. So I'm not gonna do that. So I'm just gonna give you the answer, which is obviously yes. Um, so what we did recently is to do, basically consider a collision of two spinning black holes in six or seven dimensions, it's the same. And this is really analogous 
to the type of events that LIGO is detecting, but just in high dimensions. So you take two spinning black holes and we let them collide. In this case, they have some boost, but there's nothing special about them. In particular, these black holes are all dynamically stable. So we choose them with spin, which is low spin. And we boost them and we just, again, solve the Einstein equations numerically. And I just want to re-emphasize that this is analogous to the type of simulations that uh, say the LIGO uh, collaboration is doing to detect gravitational waves. And this is what you find in high dimensions. So it turns out that these black holes merge and they form these type of dumbbell type geometries. And if the, if the total angular momentum is large enough, you see these portions of black strings, which unsurprisingly become Gregor Laflamme unstable. And uh, in all likelihood, uh, this system would again uh, lead to a pinch off of the horizon in the manner which is qualitatively and quantitatively similar to what we saw earlier for, the gray, for black strings. And in this case, there's no fine tuning. These black holes are perfectly stable. So this just clearly demonstrates that this Gregor Laflamme dynamics that we saw in unstable black holes is completely generic in high dimensions. Again, this is a three plus one simulation, so it's much harder to get close to the singularity. Is there an so, obvious reason why it doesn't happen in four dimensions? Uh, it's, well, first of all, in high dimensions, uh, you can you don't have stable Keplerian orbits, um, mm. but um, so you have to be slightly more careful how you choose the impact parameter in order to have a merger, but there's no fine tuning uh, really, uh, that needed. In four dimensions, if you fine tune the initial data, what, what you find as the so-called wheel pull orbits. So you find black holes that spin all of a sudden seem to want to merge, but they not quite. So they actually manage to orbit around each other for, for a long time and radiate away all the extra angular momentum that they need to in order not to form these, uh, these dumb, mm. dumb black holes. Also is that whilst uh, in a certain, in high dimensions, you can find quasi-stationary black holes with these uh, shapes, dumbbell shapes. This does not seem to be possible in four dimensions. Well, how, is it worth saying there's no black strings in four dimensions? Yeah, yeah, that's related to this, to this fact that there's no black strings in four dimensions. All right. But also, the, also it's true that in high dimensions, gravitational radiation is less efficient in, in radiating away uh, mass and angular momentum. So uh, uh, it, because of the faster fall off of the, of the gravitational potential. So the system cannot get rid of angular momentum that easily as you increase the number of dimensions. And that's also related to these dynamics, of course. Okay, so some of the open issues is first in all these works, one tracks the apparent horizon. And what we would really like to know is what happens to the event horizon. Does it really pinch off or not? And uh, what happens to observers at infinity? Are these naked singularities observable or not? And in none of the previous works, this has been addressed uh, in a manner that would satisfy mathematicians. But given that these geometries, you can approximate them with uh, as a sequence of black strings and static black holes, then it seems that the apparent horizon should be tracking the event horizon very closely. So what is true is that arbitrarily large curvatures should be observable. Whether this has anything, to, where this affects the structure of null infinity, that's something which is not known. And as I emphasized several times, for me, one of the open issues is whether the pinch off is controlled uh, by an attractor just as in fluids. Because if it's controlled by an attractor, then the details of how the pinch off happens would be completely relevant. OK, in the last uh, 10 minutes or so of my talk, let me uh, describe what's the situation in anti deciduous spaces. And I just will emphasize examples in which the physics is completely different to what we've seen uh, in these uh, Gregor Laflamme instabilities. But um, just for the benefit of the audience, you have to motivate why we do anti sitter Of course, uh, for physicists uh, or string theorists, there is no motivation uh, because uh, GR and anti uh, in anti sitter spaces um, is relevant for uh, certain types of uh, strongly interacting 
pH theories. Just uh, to remind you, in anti-theta space, uh, setting up initial conditions is not enough. One has to specify boundary conditions, and boundary conditions play a crucial role in this conjecture, as we shall see, because uh, anti-theta space can be depicted as this cylinder. So infinity, null infinity, is uh, is the boundary, and is time-like, right? So if you provide initial data in anti theta space on a space-like surface like so, one can only predict a portion of the future. If you want to predict the full space-time, you need to specify boundary conditions. So initial data and boundary conditions define the problem, right? And of course, as we shall see, this will have an impact into uh, these, uh, how we understand the weak cosmic censorship conjecture. So, as I, as I said, um, in all the examples that I just discussed uh, in asymptotically flat spaces, they would have their counterparts in ADS if you just considered small enough black holes. So the examples that I want to discuss next are genuinely unique to anti space and uh, the properties of, 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 uh, of anti theta space, the fact that it has a boundary. So the first class of examples uh, was put forward by uh, these authors and they consider this uh, just four dimensions, just for simplicity, and this um, just Einstein Maxwell with a negative cosmological constant. So the boundary conditions they specified for the metric are just uh, the usual ones. We just uh, put a flat metric at the conformal boundary. This means that they work in the so-called Poincaré patch. However, um, for the Maxwell field, they uh, put a source uh, for the electric field. And from the point of view of ADS-CFT, that's absolutely fine. There's nothing uh, special about this. And um, we do this all the time. So that's a perfectly well-motivated boundary condition. Crucially, this source, um, the details are not important. The only thing which is important is that it's localized at the boundary, say it's values, small values of the, these radial coordinates along the boundary. And uh, it's uh, varying in time. So the strength of the source for the, for the electric field as a, is a function of time. In the interior, they just they start as initial conditions with just empty anti theta space. And moreover, in the bulk, they have no charged matter. And they insist in having a zero temperature horizon, like which, of course, at initial time is just a Poincaré horizon. So in this setting, these uh, authors, they had shown that if you consider only static solutions, you can only find regular horizons as long as the, the electric field at the boundary is less than some maximum value given by some value of this constant. The details are not important, but it's just some order one number, okay? So you can only find regular black holes uh, if really extremal black holes for some values of A less than this. So then the strategy is, is actually clear. So since you are free to specify boundary conditions, then what you can do is to crank up this function from say zero, which is ADS, to some value which is greater than this maximum value for which uh, regular horizons exist. And indeed, what they find is that uh, the curvature of uh, this extremal horizon grows without bound but uh, no singularity forms in finite asymptotic time. So it takes an infinite amount of time to actually form a singularity. But I want to emphasize that the singularity that one would form in this setting is totally different to what we saw in asymptotically flat space. So in asymptotically flat space, the, there's a ever decreasing portion of the string which breaks, right? So it's like in fluids, it's like a mi microscopic amount of mass would be then uh, forming this naked singularity. Well, in this case, the singularity would have a macroscopic mass. Okay, so it would not be a Planck size like singularity, it would be like a macroscopic singularity. Very different from the Gregula Flamme case that we saw earlier. But of course, one uh, question is whether it is reasonable to evolve to force the system into having a singularity, because with the boundary conditions that they end up imposing, there can't be any a regular horizon in the bulk. So it's not clear whether this choice of boundary conditions is uh, is somewhat generic 
what that said is kind of forcing the singular is forcing the system to be singular because that's what a source at the boundary does. I sorry, may I ask a question, please? Yes. Uh, just to understand uh, your first point, which was for a less than a max, you got a regular extremal planar black hole. Just That's to correct. Understand, this is the standard extremal black hole where the Cauchy and event horizons coincide, right? Like zero yes, temperature. That is correct. Yes. I'm just wondering whether, you, you know, as you know well, of course, these extremal black holes are particularly sort of teetering on the edge of instability because the Cauchy horizon has come right out to the event horizon. And I was just wondering whether some of the, these features are because of that, uh, you know, the propensity to form the singularity and so on. How about yes. uh, trying a solution which has a finite temperature? Sorry, please go ahead. Uh yeah, I mean, they comment on this and, and again, they show that they reach the same type of singularity if you have a finite temperature. So with finite temperature, you don't see this type of singularity, but mm -hmm. again, you can manage playing with the sources to lower the temperature mm -hmm. and, and find similar type of singularities. I see. Um, but if I remember correctly, I think with finite temperature, they did not see this type of singularities. However, you could find other types of singularities playing the same game. Because again, playing with the sources and finite temperature, mm -hmm. you can you can form some black holes, which they called in another related paper mushrooms. So again, playing with the source at the boundary, you can you can in principle make these black holes, these horizons, also break. But then the singularity you would see would be more like the Gregula flame type singularity we saw earlier. So these type of microscopic singularities you don't see it in finite temperature, as far as I know. I see. Thank you. So finite temperature, you can, yeah, playing with boundary conditions, you can see Gregula flame type singularities. I see. I see. Thank um, you. Thank you so much. Sure. So one interesting, but as you said correctly, these extremal black holes can be kind of, these singularities can be kind of uh, unstable. And in this regard, uh, these authors also uh, found some, I would say, rather unexpected connection with the Greek uh, weak gravity conjecture in these systems. So just to remind you, the Greek gravity, the weak gravity conjecture states that in any consistent theory of quantum gravity, uh, there should be particles uh, whose uh, ratio of the mass and, and the charge should be greater than one, which basically means that gravity should be the weakest force. What these authors found is that if you allow for charged matter in the bulk, then you can save the weak cosmic extension conjecture. So moreover, if the weak gravity conjecture holds, then you cannot violate the weak cosmic censorship conjecture in these models because a black hole nucleates before you form a singularity. And also just a different way to state the same thing is that the minimum amount that you need uh, that of the charge of this charged matter uh, in order to save the weak cosmic censorship is agrees with the Greek gravity conjecture. So it's not clear to me whether uh, it's not clear whether there's a deeper connection between these two conjectures, but that's something which uh, I think is worth uh, looking at. So just to quickly finish, the last class of examples uh, in ADS have to do with the turbulent dynamics of gravity in ADS with reflective boundary conditions, namely just have just the standard uh, boundary metric for ADS, no sources. And there are three different, I would say, prominent examples of these dynamics. One is the, is the fact that it's known that ADS, unlike flat space, is unstable to black hole formation. So in principle, for arbitrarily small perturbations, if you wait long enough, but yet find a time, which depends on the amplitude of these perturbations, you form a black hole. So in principle, um, it is it might be possible to form arbitrarily small black holes um, with uh, generic initial conditions in ADS. Another instance, which is perhaps less known to the physics community, is this conjecture put forward by these uh, mathematicians who showed, who conjectured that all black holes in ADS, say Schwarzschild or even slowly rotating Kerr, should be nonlinearly stable uh, if you put perturbations with large angular momentum. Because for perturbations like a scalar field with large angular momentum, they show that they remain, they can live uh, for a very long time. In fact, the black holes are stable 
but they only decay logarithmically in time. And for a nonlinear system, which has such a slow linear decay, one should expect that as soon as you allow for nonlinear interactions, that some kind of instability should occur. And again, this is uh, something which should affect high L mode, so large frequencies. Sorry, Pau, so you mean nonlinearly unstable, is that right? Yes, nonlinearly unstable. That's oh, right. I, think, I see, you've written stable, but I think you meant Oops. unstable. Oops, yes, yes, yes. that's okay. right. Is nonlinearly unstable. Sorry for this typo. That's a typo, there, indeed. That was one of so, the other answers. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so, I, have, so I have a question. Yes. Question about the setup. So you know this uh, uh, instability of ADS story. Is it, 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 it a strictly ADS or like a like a string theory application? If we want to consider a very small perturbation, we would uh, have to think about ADS five crosses five. Yes. Yeah, but uh, um, in this context, this is strictly ADS5, or it doesn't matter? I mean, if, if you relate these two statements, then it, it shouldn't matter if you have a small black hole. So my question was, a similar statement holds for ADS5 equals ADS5, or it's yeah, just a strictly I, ADS5 story? Uh, I, believe, I believe it holds also for ADS5 equals ADS5. OK. Now, of course, in ADS5 crosses 5, as soon as you allow for dynamics on the S5, you can get new instabilities, as you know very well, which may be also gray wolf type. type. Um, and last but not least is the superradian instability of Kerr ADS. So as you know, so rapidly rotating black holes are unstable to superradian. So these are modes that would extract angular momentum from the black hole. But in ADS, because of the time-like boundary, these waves that carry away angular momentum cannot escape. So they can bounce back. And, and it's not clear uh, what the endpoint of, of this instability is, partly because there's no plausible known endpoint. So um, in fact, these two authors looked at the numerical evolution of this instability, and they indeed saw that these uh, unstable black holes develop a structure on the horizon at high frequencies. So in all these examples, there is, seems to be a very strong energy cascade to the UV, which suggests that you might form a singularity. Um, but as I said, uh, this is not known now whether this happens or not. Um, so the question is, can you form the singularity in finite time? As I said, we don't know. There is one case which we know something, which is in, the, in ADS3. If you start with initial data, uh, which has total mass below uh, the um, within the mass gap, so total mass less than the mass of the first black hole, then uh, these authors show that the space-time that results from the evolution of this, of this initial data becomes rougher and rougher with time, but it takes an infinite amount of time to actually form a singularity. So it is possible that in all the previous examples, um, it takes infinite time, and that's quite different from the Gregor of instability. So, because I'm running out of time, let me quickly summarize and discuss. So we've seen some examples in which the weak cosmic censorship violation is violated. Our goal is to understand the details of how this happens and maybe learn something is possible about quantum gravity. But also, it's not that I want to sort of annoy Penrose or anyone, but the point is to sharpen, understand these uh, this conjecture better and see what can actually be proven. The known mechanism that uh, we uh, have in for Kaluza Klein spaces and asymptotically flat spaces is the Gregor Flam instability. This is generic and it leads to mild violations of the conjecture in the sense that the regions that pinch off involve microscopic amounts of uh, matter. So in ADS, uh, Playing with the boundary conditions gives us more freedom and understanding what is natural, what is not, and how this affects the conjecture is important. And these authors also put forward the possibility of uh, forming singularities in flat space. But in this case, the argument is based essentially on linear physics, and the evolution is fully nonlinear. And in flat space, because you don't have uh, uh, reflective boundary conditions, it's, it's, uh, the nonlinear aspects of the problem are even more important, so it's not clear uh, whether one can find a singularity or not. So just to finish, uh, you may ask, OK, we have all these examples. What if this is violated? I would say it depends on the mechanism and the type of singularity. 
if the if so are these singularities bad and again it depends right if you are a mathematician that wants to prove global existence of solutions then yes because singularities prevent you from doing so however um if singularities are of the mild type which involve microscopic microscopic amounts of mass and as there's an attractor controlling them then the details of how this happened are completely irrelevant as far as macroscopic physics is concerned and moreover even the singularities are non-generic, even if we require polynomial fine tuning, which is what happens for joptic uh, singularity, then that's fine, I would say, because experimentalists are uh, experts in doing this type of uh, fine tuning. So eventually, if these singularities, uh, which require this fine tuning could uh, be formed in the lab, then that would give us access to uh, direct access to quantum gravity. So who knows? So that's all. Thank you for your attention and sorry for running out of time. <coughs> thank you, Pau, for a very, very nice talk. Wonderful movies. Uh, let's all thank uh, Pau. And we certainly have some time for questions or discussion. Does anyone uh, want to kick, kick off the uh, proceedings? May, may I ask a question, Toby? This is some yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Pao, uh, for a very nice and clear talk. Uh, but just to come back to four dimensions, then I, I just wanted to make sure I, I sort of understand uh, the, the main lessons. Uh, let's say we have generic initial conditions, asymptotically flat, four dimensions, the real world. Uh, mm -hmm. There are no known examples, is it, of weak cosmic censorship violation? Yeah, I mean, that is correct. Okay. I see. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, that is correct. As I said, I was rushing towards the end. There's been this conjecture about the superrating instability, but in, in order to have this instability in four dimensions, uh, you need, for example, a massive scalar, yes. right? These, in this case, this leads to an effective potential with a wall that can lead to these sort of almost reflective boundary condition. But of course, because the system, the system is self-interacting, uh, uh, it's not clear that once you include all nonlinear effects, Part of the scalar field will be absorbed, part of the scalar field will be emitted and escape to infinity, mm -hmm. right? Carrying away angular momentum. So it's not at all clear mm -hmm. that these can lead to a singularity in finite time. Whilst in ADS, even, even if the scalar field escapes to infinity, it will bounce back. Right, right. right? And right. I think that is the crucial difference. Um, yeah. So it's not at all clear where this cascade is fast enough. Mm. Mm. Okay. I see. And, and sorry if I may ask a quick follow up, if that's OK. Uh, no, of course. Uh, OK. Uh, thank you. So uh, and vis-a-vis -vis non generic initial data, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the, the field, but uh, do we understand whether Choptuix initial conditions are among the set of non generic ones, the most generic or, or is there is there a classification of you know, how least non-generic you need to be, that sort of thing. Perhaps you were alluding to it in your polynomial time comment. Yeah, no. So in the context of a, of a, of tropic uh, um, critical collapse, mm -hmm. it's spherically symmetric uh, mm -hmm. with a scalar field, then the initial data that leads to the naked singularity is co-dimension one. So we know exactly how non-generic it is. Okay. Now, of course, in the, if you allowed for all sort of uh, dependence, then it would be higher co-dimension, so, so harder. But within this class, then even if it's non-generic, it only requires is a polynomial fine tuning that you need to do. It's not like exponential fine tuning, mm. right? That would make it uh, even much harder uh, yeah. to, to get. But polynomial fine tuning is something that I'm sure that experimentalists, which I'm not, uh, do it all the time. In, in to study certain systems. So it's it's not too bad for physicists, I would say. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you we, for the question. We have a question in the chat actually from Bahve. Would you like to unmute and um, ask your question? Hello, uh, hello, yes. Um, so uh, I just I was I was thinking when you were talking about black strings that can we think of them as some uh, as the question says can can we think of them as can think of them as some correlation between these black holes and can we further comment about entanglement and trouble using them? 
sorry, I'm going to read the question in the chat if you don't mind, just to give me a sec. Um, uh, in this black strings case, I mean, the, blacks, the black hole is the hole, right? So I don't think that you can see these black strings. Maybe you have, what well, you have in mind is some kind of like Einstein Rosen bridge or like wormhole connecting to a region or something. I don't think you can think of these black uh, uh, in, in these ways because the black, as I said, the black strings connecting these black holes are all part of the same black hole. Um, in terms of what entanglement entropy does in these uh, highly dynamical systems, um, no one has looked into it. Um, so I cannot uh, say anything about it. But given that these kind of codes that we have nowadays are horizon penetrating, um, in principle, one could look at entanglement at an entanglement entropy or things like that. Uh, but no one has, has looked into this. That's all I can say, unfortunately. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Any more questions or comments? As if uh, other people, oh, if, if somebody wants to ask a question. Uh, oh, uh, one uh, quick question. Maybe you could tell us something about the um, the software you're using for numerical simulations, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we we are using um, our, our part of a collaboration, as you saw in my initial slide, called GR Chombo. And that's the software we are using. It's a public code, um, so you can download it from GitHub. Um, and basically the feature that makes it different from other publicly available codes in, in out there is that it has adaptive mesh refinement, right? So that is a feature that you need if you want to resolve all these small features that appear during during the evolution uh, for this global farm instability, and at the same time keeping the computational cost uh, under control. Uh, and this code. Again, because it uses adaptive mesh refinement, it's based on a it's a finite difference code, which runs on CPUs. And you're using quite a few levels of refinement in those simulations, I think. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, again, it depends on the setting, but we use um, um, 13, 14 levels. In 13, is something that we can reach in three plus one given the resources that we typically have access to. Um, in some of these two plus one simulations um, that I showed for the for this ultra spinning instability of rotating black holes, we use up to 22 levels, for example. So these are very deep uh, mesh hierarchies. And you need that if you want to resolve all these small features. I mean, in some sense, in these problems where you're trying to track up to a singularity that's happening in a finite time, it's the optimal situation for AMR. Yeah, absolutely. But again, it's 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 a blessing. Oh, you, it's optimal, but at the same time, you have to be very careful because every time you refine, um, you are introducing high frequency noise, right? When you do interpolation between various levels, so these high frequency noise, on the one hand, can trigger instabilities, right? Especially because these strings they are very long, very thin, so they are highly unstable and these modes can have uh, these modes that you're introducing by because of the method you're using can have a very fast uh, growth rate which can uh, be faster than the physical ones that you should be also with that you're also resolving um, but they may hide some of the physics so you have to be careful with that and also this high frequency noise you have to be careful also how your levels are placed because if they are too close to the apparent horizon, for example, they can uh, also contaminate a bit the dynamics. So, so it's 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 a bit tricky sometimes. You need to be you need to make sure that you understand exactly what's what's going on. Ma Masanori, I think you had a ah uh, yeah yeah. It's a not really a question. It's just a vague comment. But uh, uh, related to this kind of uh, uh, topology change in the real time. Uh, it, of course, if we can do say something at least qualitative from uh, gauge theory side, it's fun. 
-hmm. And uh, so when uh, you, you're mentioning uh, black, black ring type uh, instability, but uh, I actually, I don't remember the detail, but several years ago, I tried on my laptop introducing angular momentum to matrix model. Like David Bernstein was advocating, uh, you know, the usefulness of uh, classical matrix model simulation to the qualitative feature of uh, uh, gravity. And mm -hmm. what I observed, so I, I thought maybe we can see ring, but what I observed was uh, if a black hole spin very fast, then uh, one of the eigenvalues is emitted and it carries almost all uh, angular momentum. That's what I observed in matrix model. Yeah, so but, I, 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 this is actually, reminds me so of a class of examples that I have not discussed in today's talk, which is indeed rotating black holes mm -hmm. uh, when with angular momentum, when you simulate them with angular momentum, they develop this type of regular flame instabilities and they develop these long arms, which basically pinch off. Okay, and this, okay. would, this would correspond, this would be the gravity analog of what you've just described of uh -huh. eigenvalue emission in matrix models. Is it possible to design something in a Euclidean time set up at some dynamically, but introducing chemical potential or something and mimic such solution? And the black hole black string transition, you know, Toby and Simon and uh, Anosh, and those people are studying uh, intensively using two, one plus one dimensional theory. Mm -hmm. But maybe we can also have a complementary approach for similar type of mm -hmm. theory. Yeah, I, I thought it may be one interesting direction. Mm -hmm. And the numerical uh, study can be useful. But you're suggesting with Euclidean time. Uh, uh, so, so in a real time, uh, so far, if we want to do, get the result in a, you know, a few years span, only classical simulation is doable. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, at, at the most qualitative. But uh, if we can have uh, some good uh, setup in Euclidean signature, introducing a chemical potential for mm -hmm. uh, uh, angular momentum or something, maybe, maybe we can uh, find quantum um, setup. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I'm afraid I have. Uh, uh, I don't know enough of, of <laughs> to say anything, anything sensible, or which is not embarrassing. Uh, but I, I, in my opinion, as I try to emphasize in, in in my talk, one of the unresolved issues in in these sort of uh, gravity simulations is whether the pinch off is something we just control by an attractor. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we would like to look at. In, mm -hmm. in, in these new black string simulations that we have. And there are several things that one can do with this, right? In particular, it's not, so these critical solutions, these attractive solutions in fluids are known, mm -hmm. right? So it's not inconceivable because these points have enhanced symmetry. There's some scaling symmetry that takes you to this point, both in space and time. The dimensionality of the problem should be reduced. So it's something which I don't think it's impossible to, to make progress analytically. But also, even if you do it numerically, there are several things that one can do, right? If it's really an attractor, it means that, as I try to emphasize, the details of how you do the pinch off should not matter. So in principle, we could do it by hand using our gravity simulations, right? Mm -hmm. And even though by doing that, we will be introducing constraints, we will be doing all sorts of dirty things. The whole point of there being an attractor is that it doesn't matter the details of how you do it, you should be getting mm -hmm. quantitatively the same macroscopic uh, evolution, pretty much, right? So, so that's one thing. In these matrix models, real-time qualitative matrix model simulations that you do, you have the analog of the pinch off, right? So my question for you guys is whether uh, by looking at these regions where the eigenvalues pinch off, could you say anything about the shapes or could you make some progress there understanding in these microscopic uh, models whether there's some kind of attractor that could uh, show or, or explain the details of when these eigenvalues detach, right? Or, or, or I think that's something which could be quite, uh, quite uh, illustrative, I would say, or, in, or informative uh, for, for gravity. And, and of course, cu coming back to your, just expanding on that point, your simulations, Massonari, with uh, Paul Romachke on this, I think the very interesting thing is, of course, at finite n in this Yang-Mills matrix mechanics, mm -hmm. 
was at one plus one uh, mm -hmm. gang mills, you're naturally um, regulating this UV behavior. So you go from something that looks like a string through to a phase that look, represents mm -hmm. the black holes. Mm -hmm. You can see how much energy is, for example, put into the high energy mm -hmm. eigenvalues that get yeah. shot off. And you could uh, compare, you know, you could sort of ask, uh, not just what, about the shape, whether there's a scaling uh, attractor, uh, but also precisely what happens dynamically. Uh, uh, Actually, one of the reasons I mentioned the black ring in matrix model is that, you know, the, what I did with the Paul Romanski is a one plus one dimensional classical YAMILS, but of course it's a some, you know, subtle UV issue uh, if we have special directions. But in a quantum mechanics, there is no UV issue and, uh, you know, high energy, high, classical simulation has robust, uh, well-defined meaning without the, uh, even at long time scale. So I thought, if we can uh, find similar analog of uh, black hole black string transition, but you know, using black ring type, and if we, we could embed it to matrix model, then I, I thought uh, we can uh, have a more precise argument without being uh, uh, worrying about the high, uh, you know, you UV catastrophe issue. But if we can uh, uh, use a qu qu quantum theory, of course, either way, maybe we, we just see something in universe and maybe we don't have to study quantum matrix model and just studying one plus one dimensional supply yeah means like you are doing is enough is there is anything in universal we have a question in the chat uh toby yes um we do so uh would the person like to ask the question prachi is that right Uh, can you unmute and ask the question, or shall, shall I just uh, ask the question? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, that, that's right. Hi. Uh, so my question is, um, first of all, I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yeah, brilliant. So my question is, uh, is the weak cosmic censorship uh, conjecture another swampland condition? Um. In my opinion, I would say no, because the weak cosmic censorship conjecture is something which is formulated within classical general relativity. And that should be a limit of a would-be theory of quantum gravity. And possibly a suitable low energy limit of some other gravitational theory uh, that claims to be so. So because it's, <clears throat> so in other words, so because GR should be uh, as I said, a certain limit of any of these uh, other theories, then I would say that uh, all of them, um, um, it would not single out uh, a quantum theory from another one, which is not, because it has to do with a classical limit. Right, all right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any more questions or comments? Otherwise, I suggest we thank Pau again for his uh, very nice talk. And I think that um, that brings the session to an end today, the sessions, and so we'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank you. See you tomorrow.